going on, everybody? We are live. We're back. I'm back in the city. You can see my, my desk. You can see my desk. You see all the stuff on my desk and my glasses. It's all good, though. Um, hopefully, everybody's having fun. Hopefully, you enjoyed your week. Hopefully, had a, everybody had a good weekend. I want my other glasses up, too. Hopefully, everybody had a, had a, a, a good weekend so far. And, uh, and it's a holiday. So hopefully you're traveling safely. Be careful out there. People acting crazy. People uh, acting crazy, shooting up places and stuff. Craziness. Um, also, I hope you had a good week. For those that I met out in Austin, it was a good, good chance to see you all. Uh, for those that I didn't get a chance to meet while I was in Austin, sorry about that. We do have a special guest today, uh, the intentional millionaire. will be on the show today. Um, of course, you know, whenever we get together, D know it's going to be a cackle. It's going to be a, a hoot, a grandiose time. Uh, we're also, um, you know, I may be a little messy today. I may not, but it, 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 all in all, the, you'll get some good um, information. We got things lined up for you. Uh, in particular around assets, right? We, we like to talk about assets over here. Um, tech stocks and jobs, um, is, is we still talk about the same things, investing, uh, making your money, make money, where to look for jobs at. Uh, we've just been heavily focused on, on wealth creation. And there's a reason for that. Um, um, you don't want to be in the year 2053 uh, broke, uh, that's what they say. Our net worth was supposed to be zero. So how, excuse me, how can we not fix that? What's going on? The odd Roblox. How are you? All right. So we want to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do. Oh, uh, and now I want to give a special shout out uh, to, I see Natasha. D's in the back. I think Free uh, and Evelyn. I want to give y'all a special, special shout out. Congratulations, y'all, um, on your scholarship win. Uh, congratulations on that. I want to make sure that you all enjoy yourselves at the at the conference. For it's Hashi Hashi Conference, Hashi Global. I think it's called Hashi Conf Global. I think that's what it's called. It's in LA this year. Uh, I'm gonna give you a shout out on that. All right. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna have a word from our sponsor. Uh, once we get done with a word from our sponsor, um, I got a little opening uh, up that I want to do. This kind of as a prelude to what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to get um, into the intentional millionaire. Uh, we'll get into get into his bio, uh, and that's who he is, and then we'll go from there. All right, D, let's drop a word from our sponsor. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Women in Linux. I am Tam, and D is in the background. And we just want to share with you uh, some of the perks of being here on our channel. All right, so first things first, if you want to connect with us on social media, connect with us anywhere on social media at Women in Linux. If that's just too much for you, you can always come and find us on womeninlinux.org. And if that's not enough, we have even more perks where you can hit the connect button. Once you hit connect button, it'll, you put your email address in here. And once you put your email address in here, it'll connect with us uh, in our Slack group. We have tons of resources in our select group, uh, people looking for jobs, people just looking for advice, people looking for information and so forth, right? So again, this is Slack, it's not Discord. So on with, with using Slack, it, I warn you, it is resource heavy, so you may need to use either the web browser or if you're on your phone, you should be fine. But if you're on your desktop, and we know most of you connect on your computer, it's easier to open it up in your web browser so it doesn't take up so much memory or so many processes and so forth. That's just an FYI. That's how I use it. Okay. And if you would like to shop with us, we still have our stuff from uh, our five year stuff. Um, still, still good. We're working on more t-shirts. No, <laughs> no estate, no date. We're still working on that. Uh, but again, if you want to shop and you want to get some merch, feel free to come here and get some merch. Again, if you come over here and click on all products, you'll see on all the products that we have from hoodies um, to masks and so forth and so on, right? And 
If that isn't good enough for you, you can donate. You can always donate with your time. Um, you can donate with your money. So how do you donate with your time? You donate with your time by saying, hey, I would like to do a presentation or I like to volunteer on helping us uh, grow the channel. You retweet, um, you share this with other members. In fact, for those of you that come here every single week, we know you come here every single week and you don't subscribe, subscribe. That helps us grow the channel. That helps us get more content to you. Hey, research isn't easy. I'm not getting paid to do research. I wish it was at a university, but hey, I'm bringing this to you, right? I'm bringing this to you and us and for others, right? So if that doesn't work, you can always donate on PayPal by clicking the donate button. Uh, once you hit the donate button, you have your own denominations in which you can donate. And if that doesn't work to you, for you, you can always reach out to D and you can cut a check and send a check. That works for us as well. All right. So what are some other things that we actually do have as well? Right. So we have a discount uh, with IT Pro TV. You get 30 percent off. Um, I've I've used IT Pro TV myself. I've done interviews with them. I'll pull those up as well, too. But as you can see, I'm logging into IT Pro TV. What are the benefits here? You need to learn how you learn. So one of the things you can do in IT Pro TV, you can come over here, you can click on courses, and it gives you a list of courses that's separating them out by certification and also set, set, separate them out by learning paths. You're like, Tamika, what does that mean? My four basic principles or my four basic foundations of skill sets that you should have is Linux. Uh, you should also have an automation tool, whether it's Terraform or Ansible. You should know at least a cloud. I don't care. Pick pick either one. And finally, last but not least, security. And security comes in multiple forms. Security of the operating system, security of the application, and also security of the of containers, right? And cloud security. So it's multiple facets when we're talking about security. Those are your four basics that you're going to need to, to get you a job and then move you up. All right. And we're going to talk about our membership here in another video, but I just want to get this out to you. All right. So that's 30 percent off off of uh, IT Pro TV. And last but not least, our calend Calendly, we have a mem we have um, set up for our calendar. Let me pull that up. I think I have it saved in my browser here so I can just go straight to it. Uh, if not, I'll get it from D here. Here we go right here. All right, so with Calendly, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions. That's where you get to talk to either me or D, uh, and you can request either one, but where you get to talk to us in a one-on-one -on -one session, right? Um, interview prep, some of you are getting ready for interviews or you've never interviewed before. We wanna prep you for an interview. Resume review, let's go over what you have or let's pull all your skills together. Let's get things formatted properly. Let's get everything going. And last but not least, career assessment. What is your journey? What could it look like? What could you be going through? What are your next steps? Some of you are transitioning, some of you are not, some of you are looking to transition, and some of you are just trying to figure out what is your next step. So by saying all of this, we want you to enjoy your time here at Women in Linux and also as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the share button, and last but not least, last but not least, thank yourself that you actually did it. All right, that was a word from my sponsor. I'm actually wearing one of our shirts today, one skill away from 200K, I'm wearing the shirt today. Um, again, get your shirts there out there. Um, don't, like D says, I think you, I think you, your mentor says that, don't, don't be, what you say, don't be world kill on the information tech highway is that is that the right one is that the right way is that how i say it oh okay well, d said i ain't say it right but she could type it in the chat uh but again um get your shirts get your skills up um and get your assets up uh, i want to give a shout out to randy uh you donated uh five dollars to women Linux. we appreciate you all um uh, for that d you could have typed that in the, in the chat let me see she, i think she typed in the back information or informational super highway i was close i was close <laughs> i was close yeah, yeah potato potato uh, d come on yeah i was close all right so anyway um i, I want to uh open up with uh something from ao is uh the the title of this uh clip is uh um how Owning your home builds your wealth and closes the wealth gap. 
Um, we're not going to play. I'm not going to play the whole clip because it's a 50 minute long clip and we have information for you anyway. But I wanted to I want to put put it out there that we often I often hear in different arenas, different investment arenas, different just different arenas. I hear that buying a house or you living in a house is not an asset. Um, I hear that all the time. Um, but I want to, I, I have my own stats that I've, I've went and looked up, but I'm going to let, I'm going to let AO start the, this conversation and then we'll get into why we're here today. Um, and then we'll get into some, some other stuff. All right. So let's get, let's get going. Let me make sure my volume is up so we can hear what AO has to say. I may have to skip through because I think you got an introduction too, but let's uh let's get started here. Honest, let me rewind. Home ownership can kill your finances, can ruin your credit, can set you back in life. What's happening? No cap. We AO about to get a play. Go pull up to the table. Let's go. You've probably heard that buying a home is a great investment. And let's be real, it is a great investment when it's done correctly and not just done correctly, but when it's also done at the right time in the right season of your life. In fact, that those uh, those who owned rather than rented had a median net worth more than 80 times greater than the median net worth of renters. Let me say this one more time. Those who own a home, right? Their net worth is 80 times higher, right, than the median renters. The average home price in America is $428,700 to be exact. And I'm pause right there. All right. So you heard that 80 times higher than renters. Um, and I've, I brought that stat up before. And we also uh, heard that the median household, uh, well, the median house is uh to purchase is 423,000. Now I went over this before where I talked about uh, what what salary um, do you need in order to get a home um, uh, of, of that of, um, to purchase? What's your what what salary do you need to have uh, to, to purchase? Let me um, pull this up right here. And I'm bringing this over. And this, there's another one out there, but this is just my quick search. I had I brought it up before, but this is just my quick search, All right? So this right here is a, from Nerd Wallet. It said, "How much house can you afford?" I said, "This is what you can afford in San Francisco, right?" But you can use this to come up with how much of, of a of a monthly payment, a down payment, your closing costs, and everything that you need to afford. Uh, to purchase a home, right? So again, we're talking four hundred twenty-three thousand as a median. You could come in here. You could put in uh, by location um, of of what you're able to afford. I mean, not whatever you, what you're able to afford, but what what you're able to afford in that city. So this just is this is just one calculator. If you went back, let me go back. As you can see, there's Nerd Wallet, and then Zillow has an affordability uh, cap calculator as well too. Also, bank rate has one. So there's a ton of them out there. You can put in your monthly gross income, your investments, your whole nine, and it'll walk you through about how much you can afford, right? And again, these aren't just these aren't hardcore facts. These are just roundabout numbers, right? Just roundabout numbers, right? So before we before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Melissa Jane. I see you in the chat. Um, Stacy Lynn, I see you out there. I also saw uh, Uncle Stu, I saw you up there earlier, and Donald Watts. Shout out to you all. All right, so when, what we all been waiting for, I just, like I said, I want to go play that whole clip. I just want to, I just want to put out there just some little informational stuff so we can get started. But now we're about to get into the meat and potatoes, okay? All right, and the meat and the, meat and the potatoes that we got about to get into, I'm about to introduce you to intentional millionaire tim grew up in a, in a and i'm and i'm reading and i'm a paraphrase too tim so we can get through it uh tim grew up in a big family in virginia graduated from community college uh he went to on an academic uh scholarship he went to old dominion and completed his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering shout out to electrical engineer 
and computer engineer over here. Um, after landing a job as a GPS engineer, he has traveled the world, building relationships from coast to coast um, and internationally. And during this time, he's built an entrepreneur footprint working in finance, right? I know him from uh, not just um, just being intentional millionaire on the finance part, but also um, gaining assets. And then also that he don't he don't eat chicken fingers. So uh, that's a that's a good thing. Right. <laughs> it's an inside joke. He laughing, so it's all good. Uh, he said he learned and taught financial literacy. Uh, he started his real estate, and he uh, he also started his real estate journey. Tim was able to accumulate a million dollar portfolio through real estate and investments. You can find him in the gym. I don't know if y'all ever seen Tim walking around on it. He didn't posted it on the show where he be walking around. You know, he you know Tim be trying to show his pecs. He be trying to show his thing. I see you, Tim. Uh, he said he, he likes to go to the gym, reading, striving to help the to help the community be better from the inside and out. Welcome to the stage, the intentional millionaire. Everybody, give a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, everybody you know, give a round but applause. that's I had to wonder what you're talking about me with that fantastic intro. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking around. <laughs> I was looking around. <laughs> You know, you got to put the but, camera, the Kendra cam on. You got to spin. You got to put the Kendra cam on. You got to spin. But All I right, knew but, it was me when you said no chicken fingers. No chicken fingers. <laughs> you know, you, right? No chicken fingers. No chicken fingers. All right, but no, so. but welcome, welcome. Thank you all. Thanks. I want to first you give a shout out to Women in Linux for allowing me the opportunity. Also, I want to give a shout out to everyone in the chat that's tuning in, that's allowing me the opportunity just to share. And I appreciate everything because I know that uh, going back to the video that you just dropped, mm -hmm. I think that was a fantastic point to point out right. because I think when you think about your primary residence, you have to look at it from two different lenses. Right. Now, mm -hmm. but, not, but not only that, you know, again, this, this is this ongoing talk topic and we talked about it before we came on, like, why are people telling people not to buy a house when, 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 pre li listen, I've been following pitch book and they're, what they're saying is like private equity mm -hmm. funds are buying all the houses, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're buying all the houses. So if private equity funds are buying houses and even Bezos himself has the bought arrived homes. Uh, why in the world would you not, want to invest and have some type of asset or some type of ownership right and i mm -hmm. think that, i think the i think there's so many uh so much miscommunication and so much getting talked past about uh, on just not in youtube in general just just people in general i think a lot of talking points and a lot of things are getting missed so i hope today that we can clarify at least or at least attempt to clarify some things for people Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and um, I think that's what we really want to do, because I know for myself, um, that's what allowed me the biggest bulk of my portfolio now is real estate. Um, right. And the reason why is because the appreciation on top of the cash flow. Right. Um, so and I think that's one of the things that people miss. And I think even with the primary residence, and we'll talk about that when I uh, go through just how to start in real estate. Mm -hmm. But I think people missing a key thing that you can leverage from your primary residence perspective when you right. buy your home. All right. And and I want to address what uh, Randy had asked. Randy say, I assume the fear is liabilities paired with home ownership. Well, it's it, well. Look, I, I so I, I'm doing I'm doing both. So I'm gonna give both perspectives. I'm staying in an mm -hmm. apartment in Colorado, and then I have my house in Florida, right? And so I give you the the li here's the liability for me staying in this apartment. I keep paying this rent every month to somebody, and I'm not gonna and I'm not gonna be able to use it as as a tax write off because I didn't do corporate rental, right? So I so I'm that's just money going in the wind right there, right? The other part of that is, um, even though it, it, people look at may look at an apartment like, oh, okay, well, I got an apartment, I don't have anything else to worry about. You still got to get renters insurance, even though it may not cost a lot. You still got to get renters insurance. You're still beholden to what someone else 
can dictate and do. In other words, um, hey, we're doing a, 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 an apartment inspection. Somebody coming in to inspect your apartment. Uh, somebody coming in to tell you what you can and you can't do. Uh, somebody coming in telling you where you can park it and where you can't park it. You know, there's a from from just from just just those little bit. They don't sound like a lot, but when you start having when you got your own home, if you decide that you want to park at the edge of your driveway. You can park at the edge of your driveway. If you want to park in your garage, you park in your garage. You you gonna have you gonna have insurance anyway because it's just just something that you need anyway. But there are a lot of things when it comes to that 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 allows you freedom. Now that's just you know that's just superficial stuff. What's the other piece? I talked about this I think last week or the week before last. If I didn't go out and purchase a home, I would still be owing the government every year. Right. When I when I when I went and filed my taxes and they was like, ma'am, you owe us seven thousand dollars, ma'am, you owe us ten thousand dollars because you don't have any assets to write off. I was like, oh, I, what, what? I need some assets. Oh, let me go fix that. Let me fix that real quick. So when I but I but this apartment, like if I did a corporate rental, yeah, I could write it off. But it's right now it's just money in the wind. I don't get no I don't get a tax break on that. Right, mm -hmm. except for the small office, but I do get a tax break on that asset that I have uh, when owning. So you can look at a home as a liability because yes, you do have to cut your grass, but you can hire someone. You can zero. You can zero. Oh, is it? It was a. Is it called zero? Not zero day, but basically throw gravel on top of your grass and right. put some rocks <laughs> on there uh, and, and keep it pushing. Right. So there's different things that you can do. So that you don't have that burden of like just, you know, lawn care and so forth. Right. You can snatch all the trees off your property <laughs> and not have to worry about it. So there are things that you can do. Now, Tim, I know you had before we uh, started the, the show, you were saying that uh, what, what, what doesn't get talked about was the tax break. Right. See, because one of the things that people miss is because sometimes people get get on um, the conception especially in social media they talk about don't buy the house because the price of the house but if you buy the house properly people forget about the tax exemption rule that one can take advantage of so what is that rule that rule basically states if you buy the house and it's your primary residence and you stay there for two years um and you don't um jeopardize that straight two-year residency that's your primary residence you can write off if you single and let's just say you have over a hundred thousand dollars in equity, up to two hundred and fifty thousand for a single person. You can sell at home, and you pay zero in taxes up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. If you marry, it's five hundred thousand dollars. So mm. what that means is that's a chance you that's a game changing amount where that you can leverage, and that can set the pace for you starting your real estate journey. That can set the pace for you going into business. That can set the pace. Where if you was the rent, you would never get that tax exemption rule. Hmm. You said I, something about marriage. <laughs> who gonna marry me? Let me who let me find one. <laughs> so and, and and basically what that means, you all is it just means that if you purchase the property correct properly, you buy it with equity going in, and as time mm -hmm. goes on, the equity goes up. If you go, if the house goes up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in equity, and you single, you can sell it home and pay Uncle Sam zero mm -hmm. in taxes. Right, and 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 that's the thing. I, I pulled it up here. It's, it's called topic. Uh, I guess I should pull my screen back up. I, I unshare it because I thought you were going to share your screen. I don't want to overshare. Let me pull it back up right here. Let me pull that up. Uh, it's right here. It's called topic uh, um, topic number seven hundred one. Sell of your home. Um, I'm see. Looks a little small. But I'll pull it up. To it. If you have a capital gain from the sale of your home, you may qualify to exclude up to two hundred and fifty thousand of that gain from your income, or up to five hundred thousand if that of that gain if you're if you file a joint return with your spouse. And it's also talks about publication 523, Selling Your Home, provides rules and worksheet. Topic 409 covers general capital gain and loss information. Anytime we talk about something on this show, 
I always try to refer you back to the IRS. You don't have to listen to me. You don't mm -hmm. have to listen to Tim. Go to the I, the R, and the S. <laughs> right. <laughs> they will have the information for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Tim, the first one was, first topic was we talked the, the we talked about the house and we talked about the credit, but we got to go back one. What, what do we need in order to first get the house? What do we need? What do we need? A, do we need good credit? Do we do we need a down payment? What 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 do we need in order to get started? That's a great question, Tam. Um, I say we it's five it's five basic things that I say most people need when they want to start their real estate journey. Um, and the first one being they need to un, you need to understand your credit. You need to know two major points of your credit. The first thing is you need to know your debt to income ratio. Um, and basically what that means is based on how much debt you have in your income, it has to be below a certain threshold. They look for maybe 55 percent. Um, that's the debt to income ratio. You need to know that. But also with your credit, you need to know your credit score. You need to know everything that's on your credit. You need to be familiar with the three credit bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion and Experian. Why is that important? Because for most people, we don't have, you know, 100,000, 200,000 laying around to buy, purchase a home. So we normally have to get it financed through a bank or credit union mm -hmm. um, or a mortgage company. It just depends on who you have a relationship with. And we'll talk about that in, in, um, in a couple of other, other steps. But mm -hmm. one of the things is you just need to know your credit because your credit is going to be the gauge on how much money they'll be willing to lend you based on your income. But also, it's going to be the gauge that sets the pace for the interest rate, which is going to also have a direct correlation to your payment. Right. So and that's I, why credit is so important. Right. And I, and I think the other piece about 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 credit where, where people don't understand is the, is the credit cards, right? Right. <laughs> like, what role, like what role do those credit cards play uh, on your credit? I'm an average. I'm an avid watcher of my credit uh i should freeze it uh cause some because but then then that gets into a pain sometimes when you're trying to do things and it whatever but anyway um I, I think a lot of times people don't understand like what your your credit cards sometimes you can leverage those and then other and then understanding keeping the the actual percentages low when i say percentage like how much you actually spend on that credit card so if you mm -hmm. got if you if you got a limit of five thousand dollars on the, on a credit card, don't don't have your credit card uh, limit sitting at at, at four thousand. Like that's gonna that's gonna hurt you. That's gonna hurt you. Right. right? Keep, make, make, keeping that balance low or paid off is really want you. And when I say low, I think it's was it is it thirty percent of of the, the of, that, of, of that of that credit card. So yes. keep, keeping that low. Mm -hmm. Right. That is correct. It's thirty percent. I say to, to, to make things work in your favor where you keep your credit score high, but you don't have to worry about the debt to income being too high, which it could actually be a, a negative impact is I say don't spend no more than 5%. It's the best is a rule of thumb that I go off of because I use credit for convenience. Mm -hmm. But the reason why credit cards can hurt you is if you don't have a handle on understanding how to use the credit card. So one, you need to get your balances down mm -hmm. to zero. I say you should, I say this is a rule of thumb that I normally share with anybody that I sit down with and consult with is when it comes to credit, I say only use, you shouldn't have a credit card that you do not have that amount of money in a cash reserve somewhere. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you got a $5,000 credit card limit, you should have five thousand dollars in your in one of your cash accounts. The right. reason why for me is because it gives you until you get more season. That's a fundamental starting off. Now, as you get more season, you uh, understand you're more aware. Then you can you don't that may not apply to you per se, but as you starting out, I say that's a good rule of thumb. So if you get a two thousand dollar credit card, you should have two thousand dollars in your account. Why is that? Because you always got to factor in the risk of the unknown where something may happen. And one, 
you may not be able you may have to use the credit card right then but you have money to then take care of whatever you need to take care of after you make that transaction right so i want to give a shout out to the blind guy and their wife i mean in their life uh <laughs> thank you i said and their wife but i know who it is uh thank you for the 25 dollars donation we appreciate you now tim you said you said you said something there that i i i want to touch on now should that money that you have set aside for say that credit card amount should it be liquid cash or should that be in the stock market should it be sitting in some type of emergency fund or where what should that money be sitting at should it be making some money sitting there i mean what should that look like well it depends so it depends on where you at financially but mm -hmm. for most people it should be somewhere that's making some money but it also has some liquidity to it okay. so for example i say for most people it should be possibly in an online account now keep the caveat is it just depends on the individual because if you're a little bit more advanced this may not apply to you mm -hmm. but if you're just starting out i say it should be in something like an online money market account because you can make some money not a lot of money but at least it gives you access to be liquid right. most most online money market accounts you can um request your do a withdraw your funds if you do it early in the morning on a, during a weekday they normally they can have it to you in your account within two business days gotcha. sometimes sooner it just depends but i say that's starting out it definitely should be something liquid but it should make some interest but you're not really it's, its job is not to really make you a lot of money it's to be liquid so if you need it right now you can get your hands on it gotcha all right so um when we're talking about uh also this we're, we're purchasing this home uh I, I know you have on your list here uh, uh some some relationships that you may you may want to have but here's here's the question um what what kind of relationship should you have with your credit and money prior to you purchasing a home i know oftentimes when you're when you're talking to uh, not just real estate agents, but say uh, GTE, was, which is a, a credit union or Wells Fargo or what have you, they're like, don't go out and buy the car first before you go get the house. Now, what should you be, how should you be prepping yourself and 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 walking in, I, I guess I want to say in a, let me, let me coin this phrase, walking in the mindset of buying an asset. Right. How should you be how what should be your mentality before you go and dive off into this? Walking in the mindset of buying or purchasing an asset. The first thing is you need to get rid of all unwanted liabilities. So if you first thing is you need to pay off all credit cards, get your credit balances to zero if you can. The next thing is and now this is no particular order because I, what I'm, the list I'm about to present is you need to be doing all of it all at the same time. Why is this important? Because this same mindset and methodologies are also going to apply once you get to home to be able to maintain a home, take care of the home. So I'm, I'm thinking more twofold. So first thing is you need to pay, get rid of all unnecessary liabilities, meaning credit cards, um, pay off any personal loans that you may have. Also, if you have a car payment, try to get that car payment as low as possible. Try to pay it off as much as you can. Um, and then you need in the process of doing all that, you also need to be trying to save some level of money if you can. Now, the thing is, I say if you can, I say most people can, but you have to know that the debt is not the issue. You have an income problem. So you want to start now taking up more jobs working more so you can start building the process to make more money mm. um and the reason why that's so critical is because there's leveraging money um so i think they are the key is things and it's leveraging what now it's leveraging money oh is it so and the reason why is because you want to get to a place where you not, not only are you showing the, the bank of financial institution that you're good with you know how you handle money but you're also showing them too that you come into the table with some level of commitment slash collateral 
mm-hmm. which is your cash reserves, which is, you know, if they sat down, if you sat down with them, they, they found out that, you know, you had debt. It'll show that you previously had a balance, but you paid it off. See, all those things are good marks, but it also puts you in a good relationship with that financial institution. So not only are you able to buy your primary residence, but you could possibly consider also doing future business, getting your investment property. All right. Now, it's, it's, it's two things that came to mind while you were talking. Uh, I was watching one clip. I don't, I don't know if it was, no, you know who it was? It was Graham Stephan and um, uh, Dave Ramsey. Mm-hmm. And Graham Stephan was, was like, when he went to go purchase his first house, he had paid every. He had always paid everything in cash. cash. Yep. And so when he went to go purchase his first house, he went to go get a loan from the bank, and the bank, all the banks denied him, even mm-hmm. though he had money liquid. His credit was nothing. He didn't right. have nothing to show for on his credit. So they were like, "You are a liability to us." Mm-hmm. So he said. He said he had to end up getting. I think he ended up getting the loan, and the loan was uh, had a high um, uh, APR on it. But he was like, they had he had to do that because he didn't have anything. But he was he was so he was so liquid on everything and paid everything off. He didn't have any type of uh, credit, or he didn't have any type of pretty much a history where the bank would be like, oh, we can we we see what you have been doing. We show you've shown us that you're trustworthy. We can now do this. So they, right. they he was like, I took them checks. He said he took them bank statements for the past four years. He took them check stubs and he said he still got denied. Right. Yep. So so just put that in perspective, like how people, how banks are leveraging. You know, there are some times that are changing, but how banks are leveraging uh, what that looks like for you in terms of credit. Uh, you actually got a question that came in. I see. Aside from paying down all the credit cards, would you advise opening up more lines of credit with added benefits for unexpected home maintenance for for expenses? Um, I would say it depends on where you're at in that process. So if you in the process of purchasing your home, that would be no, because now you just change your financial um, snapshot. And now they're going to have to go back and reprocess. Because they're going to tell you that when you open up, you know, when you start a mortgage, the mortgage process, they're going to tell you, do not open any new lines of credit. Don't open up any new accounts. Don't do anything because now it makes it they, one, they're going to have to re underwrite. But also, two, it shows that there could be some sketchiness going on. So they're going to base everything around what you send them at that current time. Um, and then as you're looking for a house, they're going to ask you for updates. Mm -hmm. on your checking accounts things like that but they're going to tell you do not open any new lines of credit because that affects the underwriting process correct so i would say no if you're in the midst of buying and purchasing the home you're looking to get financing now if you in another space or a different situation for example let's just say now you already in the house and you're looking to do upgrades, prepare for maintenance, things like that. That's a different scenario, different case. Mm-hmm. And then the, the other thing too is like mm-hmm. when you when it depends. So when 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 I say it depends, it depends on if you're buying a if you bought a house where you where you're going into it knowing that 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 it's going to be a fixer upper, but it's livable once you get into it, right? And maybe you didn't take out a two or three k loan on it. Maybe you just like we'll do this, we'll modify this over time. Mm-hmm. Right. So you may want to take out uh, you may want to get with um, a general contractor that may come in and set up. And this is just my own personal experience that will come in and do an overall view of everything that you want to change. Mm-hmm. And then you work with that contractor and his people to say, OK, well, we want to do bathrooms uh, first or we want to do this side of the house first or I want this part of the house done first. So that way you can do it in sections. You know how much money it's going to take for you to to invest and 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 make those changes. The other flip side of that is 
you may get a house that's already that's already set up in turnkey and you don't have anything that's a problem so you may just get yep. uh, you may get a house that, that that has a new home that may have a warranty in on uh, appliances and stuff for a year you may do something with like american home shield or you may do something with progressive or all state a state farm with for and, and use their warranty pieces it depends on what you buy Right. And depends on on how new it is. Now, when I say what you buy, I mean, how how new it is. Is it is it something from from 2021? Is it something from 2019? Is it something from 1950? Is it something from 1930? Is it, it did you purchase in a historical district? If you purchase purchase a home in an historical district, you have to maintain uh, some maintain what they consider historical so ch some changes you may not can make and some changes you may can make right it, it all depends on what you buy the in terms of the year that you're buying that in right so you mm -hmm. so so some things you may not you may not need that line of credit that you may be thinking of in order to maintain the home right you may mm -hmm. you may get a warranty you may it may be back on the builder depending on how new it is uh it might be might the house might might be settling and they know that that's something in there again what what's this going to boil down to where you were where you going to know this your home inspection yep. Yep. <laughs> your home inspection your home inspection uh is going to tell you a lot this going to tell you a lot Right. Um, and, 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 and speaking of home inspections, would you trust um, an inspector that works with the, the selling agent or would you go out and get your own? I would recommend everybody go out and get their own. <laughs> and the reason why is because you don't want no conflict of interest. Um, and you don't know if they may, if they have their own person, they may be getting a <laughs> kickback. They may not be doing the best job or they may overlook some things that could be pressing to you or may affect you as the buyer. But because they're working for the seller, they're only interested in getting it pushed through. Yep. So I say you always want to get your own. And that's kind of um, you. you uh, that's just jumping a little bit because that's a, one of the points I was going to make as well. Um, um your home warranty and you're having a home warranty, but also building a relationship and getting you a home inspector are the two most critical people that you need on your side um, because it protects you. The home warranty just basically say just like uh, car insurance, just like um, health insurance. The home warranty is just in case something go wrong in the home. Some things in the home is covered. For example, now it is some 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 cons to a home warranty, but it is some pros to it as well. The thing is, the home warranty normally doesn't cost is a very affordable, and what it covers is something is let's just say your HVAC or the AC breaks. They'll send a team out. You do got to pay a deductible, but they'll send a team out to assess what's going on, and if they can't fix it, most of the time they're going to piece together or they're going to repair it. But if they can't repair it, then you get something brand new. Mm -hmm. um i i was able one of my properties um i was able to get a brand new um six thousand dollar hvac unit by having a home warranty and the only thing i was responsible for was 150 dollars mm -hmm. so i think you know it's these type of things that you have to know that they don't tell you about when it comes to home ownership because people get fearful of the maintenance part mm -hmm. but there is some level of protection for the maintenance um, now, when it comes to like Tam mentioned about the home inspector, that's going to protect you. So that way you make sure you're not buying a lemon of a home. <laughs> <laughs> just drop, just drop. 10,000, 20,000 on the roof, 10,000 on the HVAC. And, and one thing you don't want it, two things that can, that's really can be devastating without having a home inspection. And that's a foundation issue. <laughs> And it can be a plumbing issue. Mm -hmm. And look, let me add one, one more. <laughs> if you're in Florida, it could be a sinkhole issue. Yes. <laughs> so in Florida, you, you have to worry about sinkholes, right? And that's a different type of insurance. Um, right. When we start talking about 
um, hey, I have a warranty, but then I also have to worry about sinkholes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we sorry for the losses for those that did lose their lives in, in Miami, but we saw what happened in Miami, right? Um, we saw that the, the building, the foundation construction of, of that condo collapsed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 then these are, but you know, I, I have a neighbor across the street. Uh, they came out. And he was like, "Yeah, my house got a sinkhole under it, so the insurance covered it." Um, but they he had to, he had to leave the home. They had to come in. They had to put beams down, and then they had to fill 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 that you know, fill that hole in in order to to protect that. And so you know these, these but again when you're looking at homes in various locations, uh, floods, places that are prone to floods, uh, uh, have to offer. So you may need flood insurance. A lot of people in Florida this year, I think like 40% of the people in Florida this year got dropped for, for their insurance. The people are not covering them anymore for flood insurance. So that's another thing you have to consider where you buy. And I know this is one of your talking points uh, here was uh, your know your market strategy, but I also say know your market um, and where you're buying it because you could be buying in, in a place where um, there was a, a landfill. Uh, you've heard people build on top of grave sites. Uh, that's right, Randy. Earthquake insurance, flood insurance. Um, uh, uh, there's a uh, there's a couple of grants out there um, discussing um, uh, for companies to come in and take brownfield states or uh, brownfield land uh, masses, and you know. Get those ready to be built on uh, any bio, any chemical, anything of that nature. Um, moving into those areas, so that, that there, there's some there's some uh, grants out there for that. Um, far as purchasing the land or buying in that area as as well too. So there's a lot of little different factors that go into into it, but it should these factors that we're talking about do not outweigh the fact of you owning an asset and gaining equity. I want right. to say that again. The factors that we're talking about do not outweigh you owning an asset and gaining equity in, in purchasing a home. And whether you're purchasing a single family or a duplex or an apartment building or whatever the case may be, please understand that you need to do your research. You need to make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. Read everything. Read everything. <laughs> Read everything. If it's something you don't know, uh, I go through, and this is something that I do. I go through and read stuff all the time. And then I be like, I don't know what this means. And then I send it over to Dion and she read it. And then I go look it up and we mark that thing. We'll mark up a, a document in a minute and we'll be like, we need to have a meeting because <laughs> we don't understand right, what you right. mean by bop, 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 and bop. And what this is talking about, bop, bop, and bop. When do you have time? Because we're not signing until you have this meeting. I'm sorry. And just and you got to stick to your guns, right? You know, it's 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 not it's no harm in saying you don't know anything, and there's also no harm in hiring a lawyer. Um, as well, too, to make sure that you're also representing and nothing is going to happen. And also reading through that document if you don't understand something. So it's nothing wrong with that, right? So just I want to put that out there. Now, now, now Tim, did you have anything to add before we move? Um, yeah, the only thing I want to add with that is, were you talking about due diligence? For most people, if you go to your local state, um, find out if they offer free uh, real uh, free mortgage class, home home buying class. Mm -hmm. Most states offer some level of free home buying class where you can sign up. They do them at some of the local libraries, things like that. And just go through the class so you can get more familiar with the whole process. Mm -hmm. That's something else you can do. You just got to check with your individual state, uh, see if they offer any free home buying classes and go sit through it. Mm -hmm. uh, take notes. And because the do it too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so but, but yeah, that's the only other thing I want to add to that. But the but the banks do it too. The banks uh, also 
Um, you can go in and sit with the bank. Of course, the banks are going to talk about it from their perspective. Of course, they have some 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 play in that because they want you to come to them and be the banker of choice, of course. But take it for what it's worth, right? Go go and sit down and get the information and talk about it, right? And also, and also I want to I want to add this too. Um, when you're looking for a home. And, and so forth. Understand where your where where your money is going. Understand your budget, right? Understand that that Netflix, that HBO Plus, that Stars, that uh, Amazon Prime, that Hulu, all those factor in into your monthly budget. It don't seem like they do, but they do, right? Mm -hmm. So you may you need to make sure that you know as you're going into this you're like you got a good idea of what you're spending every single month and if you can hold off and cut all those things off until you purchase your home i guarantee you once you get rid of it you won't miss it you'll be like oh that came on the tv let me go see if i can go find it on youtube and let me go see if i can go find it on, on something else right uh mm -hmm. you, you you just have to catch the replay it's okay you ain't up on current events it's okay you just have to catch the replay but it's okay it's 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 it's, it's, it's art it's captured in video it ain't going nowhere you'll you'll be able to get that back <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do the you could do the clips on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you on YouTube, like just watch all the little clips. Oh, it's five minutes. Oh, that's what happened. Oh, that was real nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So in here, you talked about uh, know your know uh, know your funding source for a down payment, and you got twenty percent. So I uh, so so twenty percent. Go ahead. So let me so let me kind of expand on that. So if you're looking at so we're going we're going to cover two things. So if it's your primary residence, depending on what type of loan, it may be three to three and a half percent. If you get a, a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type loan, um, but if you're looking as an investment rental property, twenty percent is in the middle, but it really ranged from fifteen to twenty five percent is a down payment for a rental property. And the reason why is because banks and credit unions or financial institutions or even some mortgage companies, they want to make sure that you're not putting yourself in position to buy a rental property that you can't upkeep. You can't make the mortgage payment. So they require a little bit more upfront costs. That's why the down payment is so much more to make sure you commit it and you put some, have some skin in the game for borrowing their money. Right. Now, what is the different ways that you can come up with the funding source for the down payment? Well, several different ways, not limited to one particular way, but several different ways you could do it. You could do it through seller, seller financing, meaning the seller that's looking to sell a home, you can work out a contract with them and they could become, they could finance you to purchase that home. Okay. Um, you could do private lending. Private lending is you can go to some type of crowdfunding or you can go to some financial institutions and they will privately lend you the funds. And I say private lending is also falls on the hard money lending. That's where somebody like myself, I have a, uh, I have some cash. You want to purchase this home. I give you the money for a down payment, but I charge you an interest for you borrowing the money from me. OK, that's considered private lending slash hard money lending. You can also do a HELOC. So if you're looking for this as your primary uh, as a rental property, you could take out a HELOC. And a HELOC just means that you go you um, you get your house um, appraised. And from that appraisal, you already have equity in it. You're able to use some of that equity to go out and purchase another property in this case. A HELOC really should only be used for upgrading your primary residence or if you're going to use it to get the build out, you would purchase more assets. That's what I would say. And then the other two ways you could take donations from friends and family. And then the last way is you could take out a loan against your 401k or your IRA. You can use that as well to get you a rental property. Mm -hmm. no. So what do you think, Tam? So I, I also think uh, this is when we're going back to seller financing, um, you know, understanding those interest rates with that, with that seller, what they want. Um, but the other thing is, too, 
when you're talking about you want to purchase that home and you want to make it a rental the two things that come to mind and we talked about this last week with adrian for those that watched um short-term rentals right short-term rentals and long-term rentals what's going to be your play that's why this goes back again to know your market uh, know what you have to do because sometimes you may get a property that that you want to get into and it's turnkey and i i recommend turnkey to people who are busy right and, right and, right you know, right and, and, you know, and you don't have time to go find the team i'm that person i don't have time to go find the team i just know i need to look at x y and z and it's gonna do this thing so while i was in austin i went and looked at a property right we went and looked at a property it was a three two it had a pool in the back so I know in that market, because because uh, because Adrian is in, in that market, I know in that market on short term rentals with a pool in the back is averaging anywhere from eight thousand to fifteen thousand a month on a return. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to get into something like that, I, I need for it to be turnkey, go in there, dust off the cobwebs, slap some paint on it, maybe paint some some um, some cabinets redo a, a, a little small little quick bathroom on a on a three to four thousand dollar budget get it nice looking i'm i'm in and out i'm I, I, i'm in and out like i ain't got time because i need to get this on the market and i need to do do the thing but again with that being said i know that it'll be an investment property so it's going to be 20 percent down right so now you so now you got to figure out where you gonna get that money from and here's the other piece when you start getting into things like this is some banks are not really really forgiving for doing purchases like this so that that seller financing and that hard money lending or being a part of an investment group is where you really gonna really make a, a shift in order to do those things right because mm -hmm. now maybe you go into an, in a pro, into a property when inside of an investment group and maybe you and you in this investment group maybe you don't come up with all the money maybe you come up with something and y'all split 50 50 or maybe y'all do 10 percent, 10 percent, however many people in there but now that money is making some money for you on that property but you gotta do you gotta be careful who you do that with because you can't do it with everybody but at, right. at the same, but at the same token know that it's an option right, right? you got to know that it's an option right so the, those are just things I, I wanted to add like you know again a lot of people say that your first house is is not an is not an asset but like like you pointed out you you could do a HELOC and take some equity out of your house again this is what bigger pockets uh, refers to as like a burst strategy, right? Buy the house, mm -hmm. rehab it, refinance it, and then Rent. repeat. Right, yeah. Right. yeah, repeat. So, <laughs> yeah. so again, it depends on where you see, how you see yourself, how you, again, this is why I always talk about getting your skills up so you can make those purchases, so you can keep your DTI low, so you can have, so you can show a history of, of 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 inc one increased finances number one and then mm -hmm. two you can also show a increase in credit lines your credit lines also increase over time as well too because that means yep. creditors have started to to trust you and so forth so again when we're talking about this i'm not talking about just going out and making money and taking you just sit there you, right you 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 know i had this conversation with a friend of mine yesterday and i and i asked him i was like how long how how long do you think that you can keep up this physical work that you do for your job? How long do you think you can keep doing that? And you got to ask yourself, how long are you going to be able to keep working and performing at the level that you are performing at now and then say in 10 to 15 years? How mm -hmm. long do how long do you think that you're going to be able to keep up that level? And uh, if you know that as you as you're getting older your body has aches and pains you, you don't move as quick as you used to move you know but you got to put things in place in order to move that 
make that money work for you is is my is my thought there. Yeah, I saw the question. Um, let's get to it. Uh, did the moratorium affect either one of you? Uh, when you, I guess you were talking about the the rent moratorium. Yeah, I think that's what she was referring to. For me, it didn't have no effect for me. Yeah, it didn't have um, no effect I, for me yeah, I think that's what one of the things where you got to have a process to vet the right type of tenants um, when you're looking at a rental property. But also one of the things, Tam, that I do is, um, and I don't mind sharing, this is my secret sauce. So for my tenants, they get December, they, they get that month free because I took and factored their rent over 11 months versus 12 months. So the month of December, they get it free. Now, now you said something that I want to, that that's funny to me, right? Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why this is funny to me. I'm put my get my laptop on the charger because I was gonna bring Cause, it up. Because because when I buy, normally when I buy, that's one thing I always consider. The first thing before I'm looking at a rental property is I do a market analysis on what the rents is going in that area. Then based off of that. I get with my property manager and I make sure that one, we're not going to depending on, cause I'm always looking for, for me, I start off with a $250 push and positive cash flow. If that doesn't work and I don't have at least $20,000 in equity, I'm not even buying the property, me personally, mm -hmm. because I work my market strategy based on the numbers that I know that if in the market make a change, I have enough cushion in there so for 2008 was to happen, I have enough cushion that I can weather the storm. Right. Now, now, how do you determine the equity? I know how I go about doing it, but what are you using to determine the equity in a property? Um, I use the, the comps and then also the comps with what I'm going to purchase it for and then what I'm going to actually be required to put down. So because I've been working with my... Um, my lender for a while then a couple of times he gave me a down payment break where my down payment was on a 15 grand i'm at 15 percent. so uh, and that's because i did repeated business um so that's one so i look at the comps the comparables based on the property but also the purchase price that i'm purchasing it for so based off of that purchase price in the comps they give me an idea of kind of what my my equity is going to be then I take in at the repair value because normally I buy where it may need a little bit of tender love and care um, because I know that's where I can get the biggest bang for my buck. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know on the other side, just and it just depends on where you're at and what's going on. Some of the better deals where you can walk in with equity right out of the gate, those are the ones that's not even listed on the um, multiple listing. Right. So, so I'm gonna give you give y'all some other gems, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this happened when I was in Austin. This was a few years ago. I was with same same people, Adrian and and my and my homegirl, right, Doris, uh, his wife. So uh, what I didn't know was, right, uh, <laughs> you can go to um, uh, these the subdivisions that uh, there that uh, once they get done. Uh, really selling out their their area their houses and so forth. They will have what they call an auction, and I didn't know about this. So you can go like the houses that they stage. They'll auction off the curtains. They'll auction off the beds, the statues, the bookshelves, and all of that. And use I mean you take that and then use that inside of the rental properties that you're actually you know setting up and so forth and so on. So that's a quick way to get. Um, some some actual uh, some actual uh, furniture. Another one is the hotels auction off their stuff as well too. So those hotels, the 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 the, the things that they've had um, in a in a lounge area or what have you, they auction those things off as well too. So just another way to quickly stage, get some property, get get your property looking nice to either sell or you're keeping it for for long term rental or short term. So, so Tam, you, you just share some gems, my back end gems, because I worked at a hotel. I worked at a hotel when I was in college. So I know about all that because actually they'll get first deals to certain employees first mm. before they even introduce it to the public. But also you can go to the Habitat of Humanity 
and get so much stuff on discount in your local area as well. Right. So, so it's so many, it's so many <laughs> things. I'm telling you, you can save money. Right. <laughs> right. You can save money and make money at the same time. Yeah. Right. Now, now you say you give your tenants uh, um, um, uh, the month of free for December. Uh, on 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 here, there's on bigger pockets. This was this had I, this was from 2019. Uh, so this guy, his name, D. If you want to bring it up, his name is uh, Joe. I guess Asoma, Asoma is uh, mm-hmm. Bigger Pockets podcast episode 356. Why is this episode reminding me of what you just said? Because what in his in his in his uh, when he's vetting, he's in the DMV area. So he's up in um he's in Maryland, Virginia. DC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he, he on the more he more he more on the Virginia side, right? right. So so he know what he's gonna get, right? right? But let me tell you what in this episode, what he does before he rents to people for for say if they're they're, they're moving in a long term, mm-hmm. what he does is he say, Hey, I want to come over to your current residence and have dinner with you. So he says, he says, if they choose not to have dinner with him, if they don't invite him over to his current, to their current residence to have dinner with him, he said he don't rent to him. And what, what he's looking for is he's looking to see one, how you maintain the house now. Is it mm-hmm. dirty? Uh, what, what kind of, are you keeping up the yard? Uh, you, you know, what, 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 what do you do? Like he, he actually, that's how he actually vets his people. And he said one thing he does do, and it's in this episode, one thing he does do at the end of the year or, or whatnot, he does give them the that, that, that month off. But he also says if it's a father or a mother or a child in the home, he also gives birthday presents as well to Mother's Day's present, Father's Day's mm-hmm. present. You know, he's like, he's like, he's like, I, he's like, I call, he said, I call my people. I have relationships with them because he's, he was like, he was like, I want them to feel at home. Right. Mm -hmm. But I want them to also treat it as if it's their own. Right. Because again, they got to live in that home. I got to come by and take care of it as well too. But he said, you also need to feel like this is you are a part of this family. Like it's like a family thing. So if you go check check out this video, it's a, a big bigger pockets podcast episode three fifty six. It's an hour and fifteen minutes long. Um, if you take a look at it, um, I had to go back through my thing and dig it up. But uh, I, I I watched this episode. I think he's been on here twice, um, talking about how he how he got started, what he does, and what he does to vet his rent his renters. He's long term. He's a long term renter. Yep, and that's and people don't know those little things right there makes the difference. That's why I can say for myself, I didn't have the no rent and all that happen. It's because people felt like it was theirs. It you get a big joy when two things. So I had one tenant. I was uh, paying for the lawn to get cut. That was part of the, uh, and they started cutting the grass in my. <laughs> My lawn person called me and said, hey, this is twice I went over there. Everything is already cut. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I apologize. I said, well, you can take them off of the, the schedule. And the tenants was like, hey, we got it. We we enjoy it here. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and, you know, even just seeing the kids, the kids excited to see you mm-hmm. as the owner mm-hmm. <laughs> because mm-hmm. people don't know it's just a joy into doing it, but also people is going to really treat your stuff like their stuff and right. take care of it. Right. Look, let me tell you, sometimes I go to these apartments, right? And I if I remember this distinctly. I went to an apartment and I was looking, you know, to to, to rent an apartment, but we I forgot what we were looking for. I was looking for something. Anyway, long story short, and this was in Florida, and the, the lady was like, yeah, we have people that, that's been here renting for for 35 years renting an apartment for 35 years and it's some people that's all they do they're not going to move they're there this is this is it they're not going they're not going to go nowhere this is it. they're not on section eight they're not on section eight they just they're just long-term renters that's just what they do that's how they live 
Uncle Stu, thank you for uh, your ten dollar um, donation. Nicholas, thank you for your twenty dollar donation. Ja Journey to Jasmine, thank you for your five dollar donation. I, it don't come up on my screen over here, so I have to look over here and look at if I missed you. I'm, I, I apologize. Um, but some people are long term renters, and some people don't have don't want they don't want. They just don't want it. They just don't. They just don't want it. it. You know, it's. I'm not gonna say they're financially irresponsible because I don't know what their situation is. Maybe they long term mm -hmm. renters and maybe they got properties. I don't know. Some people do that. Some people would stay in an apartment. I had a coworker. <laughs> no lie. I had a coworker. He 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 owned three homes and rented a room, uh, and lived in Sarasota. And his three homes that he had were both, uh, all three were worth uh, at least a million dollars a piece. And he had long term renters in there, right? Some mm -hmm. people just don't want that responsibility. But he, I mean, he had his own personal home, but it's a long story short why he had what he had. But again, he had, he had his, his properties had gained enough equity in it because he bought that. I know he bought that house for 350000 when he first purchased that house. That house right now, you can't even get in that neighborhood under a billion dollars, right? And he mm -hmm. bought that back in 2014. Um, the house that, 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 that's in, that was in, uh, in Orlando, uh, he bought that house when his kids was young. That house, he ended up selling that house for 700000 right? So mm -hmm. again, you, you talk about equity over time, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta think, what were the strategies that we're talking about right now uh, are, are are gaining wealth over time, right? Is 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 time, right? Anything like the it takes twenty eight years for a person to become a millionaire. That's 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 the that's on average, right? And the average person who is a millionaire, and this was this was talked about earlier this year. The average age that a person actually becomes a millionaire is sixty two. Now I feel like that at that age is gonna keep that that number is gonna get um it's gonna be like early, right? You're gonna see right, like right, people right, right, over right. time, it's not gonna be 62, it's not gonna take 28 years, it's gonna be you know quicker, right? It's gonna be mm -hmm. oh, the average millionaires 40 years old, they became a millionaire at, at 32, like that that speed is gonna come come over time. How how however, however, we have to understand that with time also comes equity, right? Yep. <laughs> right. And, and you can use this 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 phrase, this this thought process in any relationship, right? So as long as you value the relationship, as long as you're able to maintain the relationship, right? So say between you and I, Tim, say over time we we're gonna we're gonna continue to work together and there's gonna be as we call it skin in the game right you, right you know what I mean? <laughs> that that trust in that and that equity and and that knowledge share and stuff is going to happen over time it's mm -hmm. the same relationship that you need to have with your assets this is my own personal opinion your all your assets you got to treat them with love and with care when i yep. get when I, when I get when i when i get my cars I treat them with love and care. If you take care of your cars, do what you your maintenance on it, you keep the upkeep on it, you keep it clean, you keep everything running properly, that car gonna be good to you. Yeah, I yeah. got one. 400 <laughs> 430 some thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be good to you, right? right? Made me a ton of money too. <laughs> right. And so it's the, the, that same relationship that you have with with it's that it's, it's that same relationship that you should have with your assets over time over over time that equity bills that trust bills you'll you'll start to see it but you got to give it time but you got to get in first yep you got to get in you can't sit on the sidelines saying i think i can i don't know if i can i maybe should could would i don't know you got to get in you got to get in. And people will tell you, um, there's a lot of naysayers out there. People going to tell you not to get in. People going to tell you not to do it. People going to tell you every single thing. And when people tell you not to do something, ask them, did they do it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and ask them, 
what were the pros and cons, right? And then ask them to give you a blueprint. I bet you they ain't gonna give you no blueprint. Mm -hmm. And ask them to sell their house. They ain't gonna sell their house. <laughs> 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 yeah and, and and what pe and for me this is what people has to know about real estate for me that's my retirement plan my retirement is not the 401k not the 43 b yep. not the 457 plan because i get a chance to get both i get a chance to build equity and get some level of cash flow yep so i get two versus one I'm going to put more of my emphasis in the two, the thing that's going to give me two different outcomes versus one outcome. Correct. And yeah. so then, so that means then if you build around that, that means then all your money from everything else is just a, a addition, mm -hmm. but that's not the primary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not the only thing that's going to bring you a monthly return. Right. 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 And, and, and the other point that I wanted to talk about too was, um, when we, your 401k, this brought it back up. Um, your 401k is another way that you can utilize and gain assets, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that 20% or that three to 5% or 3.5 or whatever the case may be that you need to put down on your home can come from your 401k. But the, the, and I talked about this earlier, um, this year, but it can come from your 401k multiple times. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know what I mean. You don't yeah. have to. You can you can go buy purchase a home out using your 401k, not just one time, but you can wait, pay everything off, and then in, in two more years, do it again. Do it again. So if you don't feel like you are going to have enough money liquid to, to do it, max out your 401k, use your 401k to purchase a home or a duplex or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Wait to get you, you know, you got 5% to pay it back because that, that's typically what it is, is you take a loan out, they say you got to pay it back with 5% with, with, um, over however many years you decide to pay that back, whether you do it in two years or three years or four years or whatever the case may be. Then you turn around and you say, okay, well, once I get that paid for, you know, once I do that, let me go back and tap it again and buy another asset. Now, remember, this is just my rule of thumb. Remember, you, you're taken from your 401k, so your money not going to make money while it's while it's sitting in your 401k like it should. However, the market's been down. Real estate's been up. Mm -hmm. So that property is going to gain equity. That property is, if, if, you're, if you're doing short-term rental, it may outperform your 401k. Yep. So now you can take that money and pay back that loan on that 401k. But what, guess what you just got? I think I think Erica Williams talks about this. I think she said um, once you get once you get three homes under your belt, you're in the top one percent. Once you get three homes under your belt, you're in the top one percent. It's four now. No, I got four. <laughs> <laughs> right. Once you get three homes under that, you're in the top one. So imagine what that looks like, right? Uh, so, and, and the reason why I bring this up is because <laughs> when I'm talking to people about private equity funds or uh, VC funding, or we're talking about hedge funds, or, and then this always goes back to what I was, uh, why we say you're one skill away from 200K, when we start talking about being an accredited investor. So I'm sitting in the meeting yesterday in IFS, I'm listening to Simon talk, and the first thing he talks about People who are not accredited investors, you need to vet them properly because they are a liability uh, for your investment plan. So now I, I got to worry about you because you're not there. You, you, you're not at that at that place where mm -hmm. I can be like, OK, well, I don't have to worry about now. I have to put in for me and whoever has the fund or what have you have to put in special provisions to make sure that this person understands X, Y, Z, because from an IRS standpoint, they don't think you understand money. They don't think exactly. you understand finance. Exactly. 
<laughs> right? So um, uh, it, uh, the one skill away from 200K is not just about so you can make 200,000. It's about so you can make the 200,000 and invest and gain assets and move your net worth and build a trust and build an estate and build legacy for your family right legacy doesn't legacy for your family doesn't come from uh just just from a man and a woman it it, it comes from what you go leave behind for other people not to start at ground zero yep people don't know legacy is your productivity how many people do you affect while you're here but also give them that fair shot and fair chance to build off off of that um i think that's that's i mean i think that's the key i think the key thing is being at 200k becoming a credit investor it allows you the opportunity and options mm -hmm. that you don't have if you're not one yep and i say this is how some things to gauge when you in that in that field i say that you should always for me i think you should always have 20k readily available for opportunity Yep. Um, why is that? Because you don't know when the opportunity is going to come. You don't know where it may come from, but you need to be prepared for when it come, you can take advantage of it. Yep. And too many times we get caught up in all the wrong stuff. And I think real estate can really afford that person that opportunity to do that. Because the, the thing is, with the 401k it has its drawback it's good but it has its drawbacks yeah. because you have to use the money for specific things or you can get penalized however if you use it to get real estate now you can use the real estate so you're using the asset of a 401k to get real estate which is an asset then taking that real estate asset and you can get touch any other asset that you want right <laughs> leverage <laughs> continuous leverage oh let me you know how people say i'm gonna rob, rob peter to pay paul you're not robbing <laughs> no. you're using peter to create two poles <laughs> <laughs> this is leverage i'm just trying to leverage some things here right it's Give me a peter yeah Give me a peter i want to make three poles <laughs> <laughs> We over here cloning right now. Look, look, look. and no chicken fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, I wanted to bring that up because a lot of times people are like, well, I'm going to get this 20% from. Well, I'm going to get this 3.5% from. I don't make enough money to do this. You got to have your money moving. Your money got to make some money. And trust me, I, 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 I knew this. But I didn't know this. Let me let me right. put it that way. I knew it because I started investing with Edward Jones uh, back in 2011. Yeah, 2011. I started buying Microsoft, Google, Clorox, Coca Cola. I was spending at least seven hundred dollars a month buying a hundred dollars of of each one of those every month. Every month I would buy. I would buy. I would buy stocks. Mm -hmm. Buy. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna buy. Right. And then, but I didn't know the, 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 no one, no one really explained like, okay, you should probably look at getting into this ETF or here's an aristocrat or here's a king. No, the, the rep from Edward Jones didn't explain that. He was just like, yeah, thanks for the business. Right. <laughs> right. I'm trying to get this sale. <laughs> He's trying to get the, trying to get this sale. Nobody explained that. But now going back to it, I was already doing those things prior to me even knowing that I was doing those things. Right. But I didn't have the knowledge that I have now in order to in order to say, oh, that's why I was doing those things. Here's what this this led to. But I have I have, I was already investing, but I've always invested in, in my 401k and I've always invested in stocks. I've always done that, right? Uh, you got a question. I, I asked this question a few weeks ago, but maybe you could talk about it here. Can someone buy investment property when they are retired? Please talk about the options uh, for that. Oh yeah, I talk about it all the time. You want to start? Off? You want to start it off, Tim? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You can buy real estate when you retire. Um, when you retire, you could buy real estate. The thing about real estate, you could buy it at any age. There's no real key. Um, the only thing about real estate is when you retire, 
you just may have to, you know, due diligence process from an underwriter standpoint may be different because you are retiring depending on how you're getting your income. So that's the only thing. You just got to have the, the, the documentation to support your income. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's just say if you retire and you're not necessarily getting, um, you're not getting a, a, a guaranteed check. Let's just say your income is coming from dividend income or interest income from an investment. You just got to show that, hey, the account is in your name. It has to match you, the individual value, your social security number, date of birth. And if you can show that money in your account on a consistent basis, then you got the you got the proof and the due diligence to be able to get a mortgage. Um, so when it comes to retirement, absolutely, I think a retired person should buy rental property because I think that's a supplement to their retirement income, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just the the makeup or the the structure of that is different to pace depending on the individual that's retired. Because when you retire, also the thing you have to think about is you have to really consider health and inflation costs, which is the most important thing. Um, but I think overarching, yes, how that how that is done just depends on the individual. But you can still get a mortgage. You can still qualify for a mortgage. It's just the underwriting process may be a little different. But I still say have good credit, understand and have a good credit profile so that way, if you need to do finance or you're going to do finance, you're going to leverage the bank's money. You have that to work in your favor as well. And you don't have to you're not able to put all your retirement income into a property. You can leverage the money right now and still keep most of your retirement money. Right. And the other piece to, to that, too. Right. When we're talking about this and you're talking about your retired, don't be afraid to use programs. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Don't be afraid to use programs. And I didn't go into the to the to the depths of like with NACA. Um, I did not want to talk about Bank of Amer- America and their and what they came out with. I I get what they're trying to do. I just don't trust Bank of America. They got yeah, a lot I, of history. I'm gonna do a stream on that. <laughs> <laughs> they got yeah. a lot of history, you know, what whatever the case may be. But Wells Fargo is just as guilty as well, too. Right. So again. Um, if you're if you are retired, right, and you are trying to do investments, um, don't be. I again, this is not financial advice. Please go seek a financial advisor. What I am gonna say is this: um, you should be looking at uh, what it is that you're investing for, right? When you want to make this investment, what are you what what are you trying to do? Are you trying to have passive income? Are you trying to do long-term rental? Are you trying to do short-term rental? Are you trying to do a commercial property? Are you looking to get into a duplex, a triplex, an apartment? Whatever the case may be, understand what you're trying to do and how you're going to how you're going to make that work for you. What's that leverage going to be for you? And that and that's going to really kind of help you in your in, in inside of your retirement as well too. And here's the other part of this that i also talked about those of you that have invested into your hsa once you hit 65 they do not care if you don't use it for medical uh provisions in other words paying for your medical uh health care or whatnot at once you hit that once you hit 65 they're like oh you can go utilize that for any of something else so I talk about this. We all are going to get older. Hopefully, hopefully, let me say hopefully. We're all are going to have come to this point where we're going to have to have health care. Again, make sure that you also take care of your health, but also make sure as you're planning for your retirement as well, too, that you're setting money aside for your health care. Now, with that being said, your HSA is one way to do that. But the other way that you can use that HSA once you get into retirement is you can use it to purchase a home. You can use that money to purchase a home. So just putting that out there. Yes, you do have to wait till you're 65. I'm sorry, but it's also something that you can do. So I just want to put that out there in case you all do have HSAs and you are retiring 
and you do want to purchase something in retirement, say here at 65, you can you don't don't think that you just have to use that money for that. You can go use that money for something else. So just want to put that out there. So the, there are multi there there's another way to get money. I think one we should do one we should do a a, a conversation on on targeted uh, index funds one day. The 2030, yeah. the 2040, the 2045, the 2050s, um, I, what that looks like. I, I will always say a person needs to start with an index fund, then right from that, an ETF. I think people need to get away from mutual funds, me personally. Mm. The fees, if you really factor in the fees and the, the time frame, most people really ain't making enough money. Um, it's the mutual fund managers making all the money. And the people that's investing in mutual funds is barely skating by. Um, <laughs> so I think it's better, people better just starting with an index fund. Then from there, the next worst case is an ETF. Um, yeah. Because the expenses is so low. Expenses affect most people's uh, rate of return. And they don't know how to look at the prospectus to really understand the difference. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, another one here, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit. You are saying know your market strategy. I think we talked about it a little bit, but I think you want to expound a little more on knowing your market strategy. Yeah. So knowing your market strategy just means when you're thinking about getting into real estate, whether it be from a or your uh, rental property perspective, you need to know it's just four major areas. You need to know if you're going to go into residential. That means, you know, it's your single family. Um townhouse um you can go up to a quadplex um that includes a duplex um uh, quadplex you know your market strategy as relates to residential then you think about land land is the next uh, category if you want to buy land whether it be just vacant land or land that you're going to use for something building a lot call it something like that uh then commercial if you want to go into hotels you want to go into um those type of things uh apartment complex then you want to consider commercial and then industrial if mm -hmm. you want to you know have a storage facility you want to build a amazon yeah. distribution center then you got to know your market strategy and i think that's so important is because you got to know before you get in you got to do some due diligence on what do you want and that's why I said, when it comes to real estate, you got to really sit down. And one of the things you hear Tam always mention is you got to be strategic, meaning you got to have to do some level of due diligence so you can kind of know what path you want to go on and then run that path. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not saying that you need to get you can, can't do some or all of the above. But I say the best way to start, is, especially when you're brand new, just find one path and get good at that one path. And then you can expand it to another path. Mm -hmm. But you don't what you don't want to do for me. And this is just unless you just have the type of network or the people surround you, you don't want to just start one, then go into something else, then go into something else, because you got to become good at least one thing, because then that's fundamentally a go across the board. Right. Because if you get a good understanding, let's just say you choose land, you get a good understanding of land then you could easily transition to res residential, commercial, industrial, because you at least put one lane and you understand that lane, but you got enough knowledge because some of the knowledge transfer over. It's an overflow. So I think you need to know your market strategy from that stance, but also you need to know your market strategy as it relates to your financing. You have to have a strategy for that as well, because your strategy also going to build your foundation so you can make these um, the actual real estate come to fruition. But also it helps you build the relationships in the network. So that's part of your strategy as well. And then the last thing, you have to have a strategy for the money that you make and a strategy for the tax advantages. All of these things kind of come under your market strategy from my standpoint. Some people may just consider just the real estate. But for me, I think you got to have you got to think broad scope when you're thinking about real estate. You can't be just limited to one particular thing. So market strategy includes the actual real estate you're going to purchase, but also about the network and the relationships you're going to build and then how you're going to what's going to be the best way you're going to finance your deals. And then the last thing being 
um, your your overarching network on how you're going to make it all come together. I was on mute. So uh, <laughs> glad you brought that up, right? You talking about retail, industrial, right? So in this one right here, this is what um, Ryan uh, Penda and I've Panada, and I've seen a lot of people do this, right? What they'll do is he took an old a old Walmart and they converted it into a storage facility. That's what they've been doing. Now, if you don't, if you don't have the luxury of doing that. You can also jump into uh, PSA, which is public a pu public storage REIT. The price of it is $332.99. I've been in it, and it's returning me 10%, right? So that's a, just another way to get into, say, you can't afford to buy a retail space. You can go and get into public storage REIT. R-E-I-T, the, the actual um, ticker symbol is P-S-A, and it's returning me 9.14%, 9, 9, 9, 9 but it's been returning me 10%, right? It's down, it was down, I guess, yesterday, okay? So that's just another way that I, that I want people to start thinking about something. Whatever is, is something you can't do, like if you can't go invest into real estate, go look at an ETF or go look at a, a particular stock that you can invest in that does the same thing for you, right? Not everybody is going to be able to buy a Kmart or old Kmart or be a, or you're not going to be at, at the 200K, but you will be able to go buy um, $5 worth of Tesla. You can go buy five dollars worth of Apple. You can go buy five dollars worth of something. And those are called slices on in Charles Schwab. I think in Fidelity, they're called fractionals. Um, you can do it on Robin Hood as well. You can do it on Weebull. You know, DCA, dollar cost average, DCA your way in, long-term thinking, long-term investing. Right. When we start talking about this, you know, a lot of people like want to go for the big the big hail mary and i'm i'm just saying instead of it's, dude dude like they i'm relating to football because it's football season the, you know you got to get a first down you know it take 10 yards dump off do three yards here do five yards there do another three yards there right break it into small pieces break it into small chunks again long term right every time you think about you going outside to go get you a starbucks coffee Go whatever you spend in Starbucks, go spend it on a, a ETF. Go spend it on a, a stock. Right? Again, I talked about this before. If you if you really want to be conservative, invest in aristocrats and kings. They've been they they have been around a minimum of twenty five to fifty years with increasing dividend each year for those twenty five years of their fifty years. Pick one. And, and, and ride the wave. Just keep reinvesting. Just keep reinvesting, right? Five dollars on a on a on a stock and, and ride it out. It's slow. Don't get me wrong. It's slow, but it's gonna get you there, right? So just does that's just an FYI. I like that. It's it, but here's the. I'm gonna add to that. It's slow, but it's better than zero. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta get in the game. Like, if you're not going to buy real estate, you can go look at places like Arrived Homes, Brown Floor, Fundrise, Acerich. Um, there, there's a ton of them. If you want to get into wine, you can go buy a wine NFT. You can go buy a wine ETF. If you want to get, if you don't want to play all the aristocrat, if you don't want to play a certain aristocrat, I brought up was it M, was it NB in in N O B L was it what was that one one where you can buy just a a, a a ETF of aristocrats an ETF of kings you can just go just go purchase those and just keep it pushing the, the it's up to you right it's up to you on how you want to do how or what assets that you want asset classes that you want to be in but get involved right. The, the one that we know, we know that works, that has the, the longest strategy. We do know real estate works. 
we we do know that we do know people invest in real estate not just in the united states but in panama in china in brazil in south america and in in, in colombia in hawaii you everybody invests in real estate all over the place there's land everywhere now how much it how much the cost and what the stipulations are to buy land in the area that's something totally different but again what is your strategy what are you going to do? How are you going to get in the game? What are you looking at? Some people some people flip watches. Some people flip cars. Some people buy stamps. Some people collect stamps. Some people collect coins. Um, some people co collect uh, 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 antiques. Um, and some people do toys. Some people uh, do dolls. It, it really depends on, on, on how you see yourself and what you and how you want to move right but but at least get in the game where you are collecting uh and growing your net worth and collecting assets that are also attributing to your net worth right some people buy coins and just have coins and whenever they need some quick cash they'll sell the coin or they'll sell a watch or they'll sell they'll 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 sell uh, a real estate uh, property or something like that right it depends on on who you are and what and what your tolerance level is you have to do the you have to do your own due diligence on what that looks like for you yeah randy i still got my stamp collection from the fourth grade from 1984. I got, I got, I got, I got the love stamp. I got the, I, I got all kinds of stamps from all, from all over. Um, my mom, friends, they used to go international travel. So I have international stamps. I used to take, take them and boil the water. And so the glue would come apart and then, you know, pat them, let them dry and then put them into the, into my, my magazine and hold on to them. I still have them. I got baseball cards. I got, in fact, I got uh I got Shaq rookie card. It's sitting there in there. I was like, boy, Shaq, thank you. Keep on doing Shaq. Keep doing what you do, Shaq. <laughs> every time I look at Shaq, I'd be like, I wonder how much my card is. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> wonder how much my card is, right? So again, is that everybody has a has their own thing. Some people collect comic books. Some people, um, some be not only do people, some people collect comic books, but they also collect board games. A lot of board games are, are, are collector's items and stuff like that. So everybody has their own little hint of passion and secret and stuff like that. But again, what are, what are your assets and how are they, how are they attributing to your net worth? Can you sell that stuff and get it liquid so that you can then go into uh, real estate and whatever that case may be. All right, Tim, you said on here, uh, pick a realtor or a broker. Do you have a strategy in, in, in which you use to vet that realtor or that broker? Um, well, I'd say a couple of questions that I will recommend. First thing is, uh, real quick, I say stay away from just a, a plain vanilla real estate agent. Um, and the difference is a realtor has to get certified that they have to consider your due diligence as the most important thing. And if not, they can be uh, held liable, as, which is the same for the realtor and the broker. Um, the real estate agent is just a person that passed the test, but they didn't, they didn't pay the fee based on the state and the requirements of the state. But they didn't do the extra level to be to have some level of commitment and recommendation saying that they're going to do everything for their client first and they have a more of a fiduciary type of responsibility. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, um, I say the thing that I would ask is first thing is, are you looking to get into investment properties? One, I want to know how long have you been doing it? Next thing is, do you own an investment properties yourself? Uh, because if they don't own any properties themselves, they can't help you because you want to also be working with someone. And not only they, they have an interest because they're going to make a commission, but they're also teaching you something throughout that process. And then the next thing I would ask is, have they ever taught a class or have they ever trained any other investors or realtors in that area that they're specializing in? So if they're a realtor, then that's what I will ask. Then the next thing is I will also ask is that 
have they ever sold any luxury properties? Because why is that important? That means that they know how to interact and work with people on a higher level client base. Because that that's critical because now you're going to learn some of the soft skills on that side when you're thinking about you getting maybe coming across a luxury property that you're looking to sell or you're looking to kind of do some transaction with. So you're learning. So the key is you're looking at, you looking, you're going to, utilize them to help you make better decisions but buy the best product but also you're going to be building a relationship that now you know questions and you know things that can leverage you to that next level to give you that gateway to where you may not necessarily saw yourself before um another thing is if they're an investor, you got to learn some of their, you can learn some of their processes, but also you can get a chance now to tap into their network through their recommendation. See, that's how I learned, you know, the whole, you know, getting my tenants of uh, the 12th month off, just factoring in the mortgage over 11 months versus 12 months was because I learned that from my mentors. Mm -hmm. Um, but my mentors is also my broker that I personally deal with. So I'm learning so much stuff. So here's the thing. I don't have a real estate license, but I know so much stuff as though I had the license mm. because we interact. I ask questions. They allow me to come to some of their training for their real estate, their, their agents. Um, and I don't never operate in a capacity as though I'm an agent. I'm there more for the compliance and having an understanding. So if I ever interact with somebody, let's just say in another state out of town, I could at least understand the language, the lingo and what's actually going on versus me just being green and not having no idea if that make any sense. So <laughs> that's one of the things. And then also, um, those are the major questions that I would ask. And the last thing is I will also ask um, if they're really to a broker, I would ask, do they work with somebody that has a class A contractor's license? Why is that important? Because if you're thinking about new instruction, um, new construction, they're going to have a lot of insight. And you want to get in that person's back pocket that has that class A contractor's license. One, because if you ever looking to do some upgrades or you're looking to get a new construction or anything like that, you have a person that you can start your lead generating process versus you just being green and not really knowing where to start at. Got you. Now, do you um, do you recommend um, any type of background check or looking for certifications? Uh, Ab or, okay. Absolutely. Um, that's part of the process. So here's the great thing about when they become a realtor or broker. You can go to the, the licensing board for your state and you can find out information about the agents. But also, if they have a contract, a con class A contractor's license, you have to go to the contractor's board and you can find out about how they've been doing business. And if they ever had complaints, all these things you can find out because when you get a state and federal license, you have to, they have to comply with rules and uh, continue education things like that and that's a checks and balance so you can have some type of records on if this person has good due diligence on that and if they're a good person of and have good character so that's some ways you can kind of start i also would say you also want to ask them would it be okay with you getting some testimonies or talking with some previous clients because you may have directed questions you may want to ask and if they say no to that that's probably a sign <laughs> <laughs> now, now now vetting the person right here's a here's another thing i don't think gets talked about too is vetting um not just the the, the realtor or the broker but the, also the builder if you're like going into a new home, vetting the builder. Um, mm -hmm. There have been a lot of builders who put trash in walls. Um, they had to come back in because the appliances was, were, or, were failed on them or the or, or the stucco that they had or the wall. It's, it's been so many different things. 
So what what do you recommend? I know what I I do. I know I I I go look at the reviews. I go look at the homes. I go I go inspect the models to see and then where they're building at. What was there before on the land um, as well too. I I like to know that stuff. What do you what are, what's your recommendation on like vetting the builder of say a newer home uh, or in a newer subdivision? So that's why I would use the class A contractors. I would use their skill set to give me some insight. So I know. So basically, I'd say, hey, you know, these houses got built over here. Do you know anything about that builder? And then if they say yes, then I will ask, start taking notes. And then that give you some insight and then just kind of do some of the stuff you just say it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going looking for reviews, um, going to the contract this uh repository and finding out what type of did they have have they had complaints have they always been in compliance uh those type of things and then i will actually go view some of their work and then go to i say the best place you can go is go to the um one of the things i always do is go to where they are doing the mock um unit and go to the mock unit and ask for a list of all the issues that the mock unit has. Why is that important? Because if the mock unit has a lot of issues, then what you can do is contact that contractor, send them an email to their, um, their support group and ask them based on these issues, did you have any of these additional issues in other, some of the other units? Now, <laughs> This is going to put them on the fire because if they lie, you're going to know. <laughs> and, the, and the other piece is too, right? This happens all the time. <laughs> and I, 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 you got to pay attention to it. When you walking in these places, walk the floors. You can feel mm -hmm. like the dips in the floor where things not level buckles in and stuff. Like look for that. Looking for a I, I tell you, I tell you one thing I just started doing that I learned from my mentors. You could take some marbles with you and roll them across the floor. Mm -hmm. That'll give you a gauge on how uneven the, the, the flooring is. Mm -hmm. If they all go to one corner, then the next thing is go outside and look for lines for water mm -hmm. <laughs> and see if it's still water sitting somewhere because the inside foundation is the direct result of something could be going on on the outside as well. All right. So that's, and, and I, and I tell people all the time, when you do that, you can start looking at pictures and from pictures, you can start telling because you didn't, you didn't create it and you didn't fester that skill set. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the, the house I went to in, in, in Austin, uh, it was raining that day. Um, and right, right on, as soon as you walk up and you look to the side of the house, you can see the water just sitting there. It's just pooling and just yep. sitting there. I was like, I was like, oh, that's a problem. We need to get that. You know, that's a problem. We need to get that away from the house. We need to get that. So I went inside and started looking. I was like, look, damage. Boom. We, that need to be fixed. You know, that, that bathroom is on that side where that, where, where that water is pooling that. So that, that would need to be fixed. You know, we need to get that fixed. What, what's going on with that? You know, asking about warranties on things that um, have been done is that how long is the warranty on the on the mm -hmm. roof, right? What the warranty on the on the HVAC, um, the warranty on the appliances? Uh, are they waterless? Are they are they uh, doing? Was it was it waterless heater tanks? Is that what it is? Yep. <laughs> uh, water tank, yeah. Water tanks. Yeah. Yeah. Water tanks. Um, are they doing that? What's the what? You know, what's the return on that? Solar panels. Uh, they got solar panels on the house. Uh, can it, you know, again, what is the HOA? Like, everybody, you know, do you, mm -hmm. I try not to move places where there are HOA, but I understand the HOA. <laughs> yeah. right? I understand the necessity, but again, what, what, what does that look like for you? Like what, what's your, what's your style? Because if you're trying to do short-term rentals or long-term rentals, you may not be able to do it with an HOA. You, you mm -hmm. have to you may have to get on the list if you try to buy a condo and you want to rent it out you may not be you may not you may not be, be able to be, get on the list you may have to wait two or three years um before you can rent because they may have only 20 percent of the people who are on the condos that can rent right so it, it all depends on 
how how you how you're seeing yourself what does that look like um what kind of income you want to return what, what kind of equity is in there another thing that i use to tim for for equity with two things i use uh for for long term we, we talked about this rental meter for just what the price is going for in the area right What's, mm-hmm. what's, what, what, what are rents looking like for in the area? Another one is um, looking at a uh, prop stream to see like who owns the home, what, you know, who, who, who purchased what, how was it cash, what have you. And also how much equity is in, in that house as well too, especially when you're looking in the area, because it'll give, at least give you the, what the owner put into it and what the value is. So, Sometimes you'll find homes that have maybe, maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, right? And people are like, "We want that house, whatever it is. We want that house." And another thing that should be brought up is um, we talked about land purchasing, but sometimes you may purchase the land and you just may be sitting on it, and that land just gains value over time. But again, that's understanding the economic development that's going on in the area. That's also looking at what what new things that are being pushed into the area. If they have a new uh, a, a new uh, uh, initiative that they're doing, um, also uh, when you're looking at these different areas and you're looking at land, also be very careful about um, the the neighbors and stuff around that land, right? Because you get you get. <laughs> You know, people see an empty lot and they be like, "Oh, I could just park there," or "I'm uh, I'm 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 gonna dump my trash on it, right?" Yeah. All the time, all the time, right? I'm gonna dump my trash on it. Y'all don't care nothing about that. It's empty. If you cared about it, you put something on it, right? So you know, I've seen land. I hell, I purchased land at uh twenty-two thousand for a lot, and and I think it's like uh, 5,800. No, it may be big, a little bigger than that. But uh, you can't get a lot in Florida, in St. Pete now, uh, less less than 100K, right? Mm-hmm. You can't get a lot less than 100K. So, you know, what that equity, you know, what that looks like over time. I had, I actually had HGTV actually contact me uh, because they wanted to buy the lot or they say we could lease the lot from you. We could put a house on there and we can build on there, however you want to do it. Um, but um, HGTV is like, we need we need places where we can build. And the guy was like, um, how many lots do you have throughout the Southeast? Because we're looking to build in different cities. And so if you got any lots, we could lease, we could lease from you. We could buy the property. We could build and you get a cut. He's like, we could design this anything, any way you want, you know. So then you get to thinking about, well, how does places like HGTV and all these different places uh, get access to these lands and, and build houses? And he was like, he's like, people don't know it uh, or not, but HGTV actually owns real estate as well, too. And I was like, interesting. Right, it ain't just for sure. They actually own and have kept some of that property for mm-hmm. sure, and probably got renters in it, or probably sold or what have you. So you know, you know, everybody is in real estate at some point. They're making money at some point off of real estate. Now, you mentioned earlier about um, funding, right? But now we want to move into. Um, partnering with a mortgage company how do you find one and why would you want to partner with one all right so how do you find one that's the i say that's the the best case for that is through word of mouth through your network um and the reason why i say that is because the best advice for something that's active like a mortgage company is somebody that been through the process and can tell you about the customer service can tell you about the actual process so for me the best way is through word of mouth but that's why you got to be i say you have to do due diligence in your network because think about this real estate you get so much leverage in real estate so you got to do due diligence to make sure that you have a good network because this can this can make you hundreds of thousands of dollars as well as give you right now tax benefits 
so why would you not why would you make everything else more important than if you get into real estate if you're going to get into real estate you're buying real estate i just say you just got to do yourself the, the due diligence and the generosity for yourself to make sure that you're paying attention to the right stuff mm -hmm. so for me i say the mortgage company should be definitely a good word of mouth recommendation but then you can build off of that so it could be a recommendation, but also too, you could start doing some of your own due diligence. If you hear about some big companies, because every area has a company that's big. One of the key companies that's always come to mind when I've been traveling, things like that is Movement Mortgage. I see them everywhere. <laughs> now, I can't say if they're good, bad, or indifferent, but I see them everywhere. So if I didn't have no, no company that I would work with, I would at least go start now researching them to see what is their reviews um who is the owners um how much more how much mortgage how many mortgages do they service what's their dollar amount what mm -hmm. is their um capitalization i will start researching some of these things because if i'm gonna look to partner with them then i'm gonna see what it's like for me um if i was to become part of have them to represent me for a, a mortgage company perspective mm -hmm. so that's what i would do but then why you want to deal with a mortgage company because the difference in a mortgage company versus a bank or credit union you will get so much more leverage from the mortgage company where they can tailor your lending to you okay that's the difference so like i stated earlier with the mortgage company that i work with you know, when everything else, the down payment, when investment properties went up to 25 percent, they kept me at 15 percent was because I had already had previous relationships with them. Uh, they know how I operate. They already had a lot of my stuff on file. So we was able to do a lot of we was able to get a turnkey property just like that. Mm. And that's the reason why. And they even told me because I had a great relationship with a uh, loan uh, officer and an underwriter and they told me hey if you ain't gonna get this property we're gonna get it because <laughs> <laughs> there's no way you can't get this deal this is a great deal so right it's a but, deal. right but i was able to get it for 15 percent down payment when everything else had went up to 25 when we first went into the you know this was back in uh september last of 2021 so that's when the market was really at a high and everybody was trying to buy and do all this stuff. So I think that's the leverage you get. You get a chance to get your lending teller to you. And mm -hmm. going back to Melissa Jane's question, this would really help with somebody that's retired because when it's tailored to the retiree, you get a lot more flexibility versus a cookie cutter process that you get at your bank or credit union. Right. And, and the other one too is, Melissa, um, don't think that you have to go into that by yourself, like going investing into real estate by yourself. I know you're retired, but um, consider maybe being a part of an investment group as well, too. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because you're not you don't have to you may not have to put so much money up front into the deal. Right. Instead of you putting in the fifty thousand, you make it put in ten or fifteen thousand into the deal, and then get right. a and get a passive return over time. So you know uh, there are multiple ways to do things, but you just you have to understand your your risk tolerance and and who you're investing with and what they're investing in, and uh, and also understanding what you're willing to 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 what you're willing to do. Right, like if you know you're not gonna need that money. Like I, and I'll say this, if if you looking to make your money back, uh, and this is a this is a this is a sore subject. If you're looking to get a return within the next six months, then I I, I would say you're looking at short term rentals. Um, long term is what it is. It's just long term. <laughs> it, right. It is what it is, right. It's, it, it is long term. Right. And some people qualify long term as three to five years. I to me, I think long term is 10, 15. That's just my thought process. But I think everybody has their own idea of what long term is for them. You said and, 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 it's an investment group, maybe. And Randa asked a question. She asked, Did I have any collectibles? That'll be yes. I have baseball cards, basketball cards, and my dad's coins. Mm. Um, my dad was born in 1929. 
So he passed down some coins that he had been collecting. I think the oldest coin that I have is um, was in 1910, and it was a Indian, a native Indian coin. I don't even know how much it's worth. I just know that I I have them put away in a case. But yeah, I collect coins. I have some coins that I don't necessarily collect. They were just passed down from my dad. So then I have a Michael Jordan um, uh, draft card. From you back know, in the day, you yeah. know, is it you know who is, is it a tops or you it's know, a tops? It's, it's a, a tops. tops. Yeah, it has the gold logo tops on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah. I still have all of mine. I, uh, in fact, let me tell you how how what my what my stamp collection book looks like. Um, this is old school. This is my telling my age. My stamp collection is in my trapper keeper. <laughs> 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 hey, it's funny. That's what some of my base cars is in. <laughs> it's in my trapper keeper, right? <laughs> uh, I got the old school classic green trapper keeper before when, when they first came out with the Velcro. You, yeah, you like, shh, yeah. shh, you be in class, you be like, you know, you back, you know, back in the day when you was in when you was in elementary school, you always wanted to go to school with the fly school supplies. You had the the fresh, fresh trapper keeper, the spiral notebooks, the fresh pen, the pencils, you know, the cool, the cool backpack. And I was and I was I was a I was a return of the Jedi ET fan. So I had the uh I had I had the the Return of the Jedi lunchbox. Box. I had the ET lunchbox with my uh, with my uh, with, with, with my little canister and stuff like that. But you can tell me I won fly back then. What I did? Did she come to school with the ET lunchbox? <laughs> yup, I did. With the, with the with the Jan Sport book bag. <laughs> <laughs> That was a trapper keeper. The trapper keeper. I still got that <laughs> at, at my mama house with my stamps in it from 1984. Uh, as, as in there, and then I had a I owed the you know back in the day Nike was where you kept what not seeing. So yeah. my so all my baseball cards are in uh, shoe boxes. Uh, yep. that's true, right, so <laughs> right. mine is in mine is a Nike shoe box and a Reebok classic shoe exactly. box. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You the all know white, that. the all white Reebok classes. <laughs> <laughs> you got my tra- trapper keeper. I got my Reebok classes. I got them too. Hey, look, look. I ain't, look. I still got my starter jacket. <laughs> Syracuse uh, at home as well too, right? <laughs> no, what about the triple fat goose? <laughs> I, got, I got one of them too. I still got one of them too. I got all. I got all that stuff. Like oh, I ain't never, I ain't never letting go. <laughs> I ain't never letting go. And 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 and, and even shout out to uh, Stranger Things for bringing back the eighties. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, oh, yeah. the, 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 those are long-term investments. <laughs> They're still here uh, and around. I I have a um I have um Brother Man uh, comic book. I got the first edition. It was <laughs> the first time that black people were uh, doing comic books back. Yep. In, yeah. So I had I have the first edition of that. It's called Brother Man, and I and I have I have that whole collection. So uh, I used to go and go in the store. The guy he used to sell um, uh, baseball cards and stuff like that, and he would sell comics. So I would go buy comic books from him. I would go every Friday. He's like, I got a new comic book that's coming out. That's first edition. I got my hands on it, so I would just buy it. I was mm-hmm. I was a kid. He said it's gonna be worth money. Don't read it. Leave it in his sleeve, and I still have them. I still have comic books and sleeves and stuff like that. And my mom would get, get to him, and she'd be like, "She was like, what you gonna do with this stuff? This ain't worth nothing." I was like, "Leave it alone. Leave right. it alone. <laughs> right? Leave it alone. That's the hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting Leave there. It alone. <laughs> I still got. I still have my. Uh, I still have my Tandy computer, my very first one from Radio Shack. 
I got mm-hmm. that. I still have um my mom wouldn't buy me an Atari because you had to hook it up to the TV. So she bought what General Electric had came out with was this uh game system called uh uh it was a Vectrex and you had yep. your own little people. I had I, I still got it. <laughs> Well, I, that thing used to used to go out of out of out of shift. Sometimes I would take it, have to whack it. I'm like whack whack whack, and then it go back. So yeah, yep. So yeah, so I got all that stuff. Long term investing. Now, those are long term <laughs> investments. Those things are worth money. Now you'd be surprised, and people want to get their hands on like the very first Atari, um, ColecoVision. Yep, ColecoVision. <laughs> you no know, plan, plan that people want. No. want their hands on those things. I'm gonna take it back. What about the spin top? <laughs> spin top but, hey, big wheels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big wheels. Big wheels don't even look the same no more. Now. I know. <laughs> you know. So again, you, you know, we wanted to bring you all today um to get you in the game. Uh I don't think it's enough said about getting in the game and getting in here and actually making investments into um j- your just your first time house or even if it's not your 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 first house maybe you buy a duplex if it is not one of those please go buy uh something uh as some other investment property right and again like i say it's you know uh, we're just talking about assets i'm i'm saying there's multiple ways we purposely focused on real estate today. I get tired of seeing on these YouTube streets and these channels that are telling y'all not to buy houses. Man, women, child, go buy a house. I don't care. Another way to buy a house um, is through your job. Sometimes your employers have relationships with builders in the area they also have relationships with mortgage companies as well, too. And they also give y'all sign-on bonuses. So don't be afraid to take your sign-on bonus and go buy an asset. You know, I just want you to want y'all to keep that in mind when you're looking at why in the world would I want to gain a skill and gain an asset? These are just ways to do that. That sign-on bonus you get, that uh that bonus that you get every year. You know you're going to get a bonus. Don't take a trip. Don't take a trip. Just go buy an asset, say, and then maybe next year you take a trip, right? Maybe every two years you buy an asset and every and every year and every other year you go on an international trip. But keep that, keep those things in mind. Um, anything you want to add before you get out of here, uh, Tim, because D keep, she keep giving us the time in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Only thing I say is, you all uh, don't, regardless of where you at, you can start today. Start wherever you need to start. If your credit is not where you want it to be, let's start making these steps to get your credit right. Um, that does not mean, regardless of where your credit is at, you still cannot get into real estate. That's the great thing about it. You can start with what Tam mentioned, investment group. You can start partner up with people in the industry. But start where you need to start right now today. Don't let the opportunity pass you by because real estate right now in today's market, right now today on September the 3rd, 2022, you should absolutely get into real estate because one thing is you don't know what the future going to hold, but you do know if you get in right now, you buy properly, you're going to have more equity in the future and you can make money in the future. So with that being said, let's continue to make sure that we stay focused. Always know that assets over everything and then allow your assets to start paying for some of your fun stuff. With that being said, I want to thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity. I want to thank uh, Women in Linux, Tam and Dee for allowing me to come over to share. Um, And this was a long time in the making, but we finally got it done. And I want to thank everyone in the chat that's tuned in and allowed to ask questions, participated, and make sure that you like the video on your way out, subscribe to the channel, and make sure you, if you, if you miss anything or have an additional questions, reach, reach out to women in Linux, reach out to myself, or if nothing else, go back through the stream and make sure you take notes so you can start gathering the information because the key is information but then implementation so with that being said that's all i have (laughs) execution is the key 
right? Um, I, I, I think I think we can't stress that enough. Um, you know, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be the person, you know, at, at 60 years old and then you're like, life has passed you by and you trying to make up, you know, you get lost in trying to make up for that lost time. Don't do that to yourself. We're giving you gems. We're giving you ways to make money, have your money, make money. Again, look at yourself as a business. Look at yourself as an asset. Take your skills and make make your skills get you assets, right? You know, every time you get a chance to get get a, get a chance to gain gain a new skill, a network or whatnot. Remember, get an asset. You know, it don't always have to be real estate like a full blown purchase of a house. It could be uh, inside of a REIT or it could be another different type of asset. But get in the game. Is that, that's all I gotta say. And we appreciate you, Tim, for, for hanging out with us. We appreciate everybody that donated today. Again, you're one skill away from 200K. No estate, no date. I got it out the trust. Go buy the shirts. <laughs> Go get the shirts. Don't forget to sign up for one-on-one. Again, like, subscribe. Hit the notification button. Tell your mama, tell your kids. Tell the roaches in your house. Get everybody in your house working, all right? We're going to see y'all in, I guess, about 30 minutes. Deal be up on stage. Everybody works in this house, including the Nats. All right, y'all be safe.